Okay. Welcome to the Physionic Podcast. Uh, this is a dedicated Physionic Podcast, and today I'm with me, his name is Alec Shaves. He's a good friend of mine. Actually, we have not actually known each other for that long, but it feels like it's been forever. How long have we known each other? Uh, it's only it's only been a year and a half now, really. Yeah, it really so is, but it feels a lot longer a, than that. Yeah. So Alec uh, knows a ton about strength training. He's a really strong uh, dude. So I thought that I would have him on here to talk about strength training in particular, but also because I wanted to talk a little bit about the molecular mechanisms and kind of tie that into strength. So we've got a bunch of questions. I asked the Instagram community for a few questions and I've integrated those throughout this podcast and we're going to be covering a ton of different topics. So hopefully this proves to be fruitful for many of you. Now, that said, Alec, you want to talk a little bit about your educational background, where you did your bachelor's, what it was in, your master's, and now your PhD. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, so my undergraduate training I did at uh, Salisbury University, um, which is a small school in Maryland. Um, and around that time, I was um, very interested in, in the strength training realm, which is why I got an exercise science um, that's what I got my degree in there. Um, slowly kind of going through that program, I started getting a little bit more into the molecular side of things. So more into the physiological aspects of exercise and what actually, uh, what about exercise makes us, uh, um, become healthier individuals, um, you know, d independent of age and disease and things like that. Right. Um, so at that point I chased, um, that rabbit, uh, to Chicago um, and decided to do my master's in kinesiology at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, and then from there, following um, the completion of my thesis, I went over and um, met you at uh, East Carolina University, uh, where I'm currently doing my PhD um, in bioenergetics and exercise science. Okay, cool. Yeah, so uh, we met kind of on the, I guess it was toward the tail end of my master's, my last year of my master's. So, and uh, you came in for your PhD. And what year are you in your PhD now? So now this is, this is my second year. Okay. Yeah. Second year, yep. So uh, can you run through your big three lifts? So what are roughly the weights that you've lifted? Not necessarily in competition, just in general, uh, even, even if it's just like gym lifts. So your bench press, uh, do you do overhead press all that much? I used to do it a lot more. Um, I've, I've started incorporating it more now. Um, it, it's, it's so helpful for pretty much everything. Yeah. Um, for it's, it's, a uh, it kind of synergized with the rest of the lift. So I've started incorporating that a lot more into my training okay. now. Um, but yes, I do include that. Okay. So tell us your best bench overhead press deadlift and squat. Um, so bench press is, uh, 350 for squats, 515 and then deadlift is 600. And then overhead press is, um, I think, 185. Okay. Yeah, so stronger than I will ever be, <laughs> essentially. Um, okay, cool. So, I, I, like I said, I compiled a few different or series of different questions, and we're just going to run through them. You just tell me your opinion on those questions. I already sent you the questions, so uh, you know them all. But I wanted to run through and hopefully bring some value and see if we can uh, kind of – discuss it, work through it, uh, just like I do with many of my other podcast guests. So the first question is, for strength, what do you consider to be a good volume, frequency, and intensity to aim for? Now that can be however you interpret that. If you consider that, you know, do you focus more on frequency? Do you focus more on volume? Do you think that people can do a bit of both? You know, what? how, how do you interpret that question? Um, I I mean, I interpret it pretty much from an individualistic, individualistic basis, but, mm. um, you know, because everyone, of course, is different, is going to respond differently to different programs. Um, but really, kind of the, you know, when you're first starting out, I guess, I guess that's where we can, we can go from there. Uh, when you're first starting out as a beginner, you're going to adapt to anything. So you're going to become stronger, independent of what you do. Um, but as you start getting more advanced in your lifting, uh, that's when you have to start incorporating more of the um, loads that are above 85% and you're starting to lift more than that one to three rep range. 
So um, eighty-five percent would be of what? what how would you of define your of your one RM of your one rep max? Okay, and your, your yes. one rep max is what? <clears throat> not not yours uh, particularly, but just yeah, in yeah. general. So, so the one rep max that you're going to do is the, is the, is the, the heaviest weight you can handle with proper strict form um, that you can only do for one rep. So mm -hmm. after that, you're going to fail. So pretty much a, a, a one rep max is you have to work. Um, it's, it's essentially you struggling through a proper range of motion for at one specific time. Okay. And you're saying 85% would be 85% of that one rep max for mm -hmm. X amount of repetitions. Uh, yes. Yeah. So typically, so again, kind of um, going above 85%, so within 85 to 100%, hmm. um, using three, one to three repetitions. So obviously, three would be closer to the 85% end, and then as you're nearing your one rep max, that's when you're obviously going to get close to one, just being able to get one rep done for that set. Okay, so there's essentially an inverse relationship there between the intensity, percent intensity, and the number of reps that you're going to end up doing. So if you're at like, let's say 95%, you're going to be knocking out maybe one, maybe two reps. But if you're at 85% intensity, so you're lowering your intensity, intensity meaning your weight on the bar, as I understand mm -hmm. it, then you, you can technically increase your reps per set. Is that, is that how I should understand it? Yeah. So, I mean, the two obviously work in inverse relationships. So the mm -hmm. lighter the weight, the more volume you can handle. Um, and as you get heavier and heavier, you're obviously going to be able to, or you're not going to be able to get nearly as many reps. Um, so that's typically how that goes. And that's typically how um, something like a progressive overload or linear periodization model works is when you start out, you know, at the beginning of your off season, you, you start out with very high volume, but low loads. And as you get closer to that um, peaking time, that's when you want to start using the higher loads, but uh, much lower volume, just because, again, that's what you can handle at, that, at those specific weights without okay. overtraining or without injuring yourself. Okay. Let's say if you were to program, let's say if you were just to talk about a week and you wanted mm -hmm. to reach X amount of volume, um, how would you change your intensity throughout that week to achieve that particular volume? Do you just only aim to hit that particular volume and keep in mind this is for strength do you just try and hit a particular amount of volume and it doesn't really matter about intensity or do you try and hit uh let, let's say 90 percent near the end of the week or earlier in the week or does it matter you know can you change those variables up like how how would you go about doing that or how do you go so about you doing that so you could definitely change it up and, and and depending on the actual program you're using um that will vary, and I think you know we'll talk about it a little bit later. But something like undulating periodization mm -hmm. incorporates that, in which you, um, in which it's undulating because you have these up and downs of intensity and volume. Um, so at one part in the week or, or day one of the week, you'd be using very high intense loads um, for low volume. But by the end of the week or the second day of that week that you're doing the lift, um, you can change it up and start incorporating a lot more volume. Um, and lower loads um, to get the necessary to like um, to meet your workload demand for that week. So assuming for strength, if we're staying with, let's say, like frequency, do you think that there is an optimal level of free, like a, should you do it? Should you do an exercise one time a week, three times a week? Like what, what do you think is kind of a decent number to aim for? Um, I, th you know, that that's, again, one of those things that's that's. Um, Ba on a person to person basis. So there's certain individuals I've talked to that deadlift, for example, they love deadlifting every week and they can handle it. Yeah. There's some people that I know that don't, that deadlift every four weeks, you know, they'll do it once every four weeks. Um, and, and the reason being is because they can't handle, um, deadlift for that period of time. Cause the, the problem that, you know, with anything else is how prone you are to injury, uh, and how prone you are to overtraining, uh, and how long it takes for that, um, for you to adapt to a certain stimulus, mm -hmm. right? So if, 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 it, if, if your turnover period can last for, you know, weeks on end and, and you can, and you won't see like diminishing, um, following four weeks of not training it, then by all means go for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're, you know, if, if you're one of, if you're one of those type of people, then hitting deadlifts two or three times a week is probably gonna be very counterproductive. Um, just based on the fact, again, that, um, the quality of the lifts, um, considering that you're, you know, you, you haven't quite adapted from the previous bout, um, the quality lifts is going to go down consistently, which will obviously lead to overtraining or injury. 
So you um, think so you think another factor to consider would be something like the quality of the actual lift. So of course, oh, that's yeah, yeah that's the, that's, that's for number one. Oh, okay. you, like you can't that that's above all else. Okay, is the quality of the lift. Right. Okay. So you would say the frequency is, and if I'm interpreting you correctly, you would say frequency is based more on recovery than like how quickly you can recover from that exercise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. And a lot of, you know, and, and that's, um, and depending on, uh, I guess what certain individuals use, um, can dictate that or, and how, what their sleep patterns like, what their eating habits like. Um, and also, you know, if they are, um, drug free or drug user or drug lifters, um, that also has a big role as well. Yeah. So, you know, people who, um, who take part in that, uh, will be able to lift more frequently throughout the week because they can recover a lot faster. Um, and they don't necessarily, you know, they don't suffer from um, overtraining phenomenon as much. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Um, so I wanted to move on to another question, which actually was posed to me by a person on Instagram. And they wanted to know, is it possible for people not to gain strength when lifting? So is there such a thing as, for example, like a non-responder? Um, again, this depends on, on where you're at, right? So if you're a beginner, probably not. You're going to respond. In some way, shape, or form, you are going to respond. You are going to get stronger. Um, but certain people have um, different ceilings in, in the sense that, um, you know, the different ceilings that are due to psychological limitations mm -hmm. and or physical limitations. Um, so one great example is say you're lifting and you, you know, you just began lifting and you're, you're having all these crazy gains, you're increasing your strength, um, and you're approaching the 200 pound mark, right? Um, but for some reason you just can't get past that. Um, there's a lot of people that, that when they hit the hundreds, right? When they hit the 100, 200, 300, um, they feel like they no longer can get past that point. And a lot of that do is a, a lot of that is a psychological limitation, right? There's a, there's a psychological barrier that um, almost makes them kind of that that makes it so important to get past that point that they actually psych themselves out of the lift and they can no longer um, or they, they 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 care too much about getting past that point and not actually um, on the quality and, and of the work that they're putting in. Um, and I feel like that happens an awful lot. Like we have these numbers in our mind that we need to get to. Oh. Um, and unfortunately they pose as like psychological limitations to us um, because we, we put so much pressure on ourselves to get there that we forget the real reason we started lifting in the first place or the, or what got us, you know, to that point in the first place. Okay. So that's more of a psychological limitation. There's also a lot of physical limitations as well. Um, you know, there's, there's a reason why, you have certain individuals that, um, you know, I don't know if you um, spend a lot of time watching Larry Wheels, for example. Yeah, I've seen um, some of his yeah, stuff. Yeah, so he's he's the type of guy that can hit PRs every week. Right. Not say, like the guy works his ass off. He works extremely hard. Yeah. That's that. There's no no um, chance. You know, there's there's nothing there's nothing about that. Um, but there's certain people that just have um, the genetic makeup and background um, to continue. Um, adapting and lifting and never get, never getting stagnant, right? It's going to happen eventually. We're all going to hit our ceilings, but it, our ceilings are at different points. Okay. That's pretty much what I'm trying to say. So there's a lot of individual variability then. Uh, yeah. And, and again, this all, um, and actually this was something um, that uh, Stan Efforting brought up, and I'm hoping I'm not botching it too much. Um, but it was kind of the 99, it was called the 99% rule, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, and pretty much what we all have to kind of, come up with is whenever we feel like we're getting stagnant in our lifts or we're not improving, um, typically it's because we're not doing the 99% right. And what that is, is eating, sleeping, and then doing like the compound basic movements that get us stronger, uh -huh. right? The 1% is the supplements we take and the little assistance exercises that we do, kind of the small stuff. Yeah. Um, but we, what we have to realize is that usually when we're not making progress in the gym, it's because we're not getting the 99% done. We're not eating right, we're not sleeping right, and we're not um, doing the lifts, like the important things that we need to in the gym to get us to where we need to be. Okay. Um, and that's something kind of that I think... Um, is an important variable to consider, especially when looking at the research and, and whether or not people um, and subjects are able to make progress because um, a lot of the times those things aren't accounted for 
you know, sleeping patterns of the subject, eating patterns of the subjects, daily stressors that are happening in their life um, that may affect them in the gym, those different things. Yeah, I, actually, you touched, you just briefly touched on sleeping patterns and even the times of day that a person trains. I, there's a recent study that uh, Brad Schoenfeld released. I don't, I don't know if he uh, did it himself, but he posted it on social media talking about how it doesn't really matter what time of day that you train as long as you're consistent about the exact time of day. Um, that seems to have an impact. And I wonder if that has something to do. This could be an entire podcast episode in its, in its own right. But, for example, like the circadian rhythms that affect the entire body uh, based off of not just how long you sleep, but certainly when you sleep and the quality of that sleep and how that can impact your musculature um, and the, the different results that you'll get in the gym. Um, so there's tons of different factors to consider, no doubt. Uh, so, but you do think that there are some individuals that are more prone to be, let's say, hyper responders as opposed to other people that are, let's say, not not going to respond as well. Yes, I, yeah, I definitely agree with that, and and that that happens in any realm of exercise we look at. Um, whatever we're considering, whether that's strength adaptations, whether that's metabolic adaptations you yeah. make. Um, no matter what it is, you're going to see that, especially like, you know, um, when we're talking about humans, because human variability is a big thing. And, um, and that's why I think sometimes when we look at these studies that say the average effect of this training program was this, but with, with doing so, you're not accounting for the fact that there's people that were definitely above that average and there's people that were well below that average. Right. And a lot of the times those people that were well below, um, are, um, usually kind of, Overshadow that no one no one pays attention to them as much uh, pays attention to them as much right. um, So there's there are going to be certain people that don't respond as well. I think they will respond um, Just not as well and it depends on for how long again before they hit that ceiling or before they hit those plateaus Right. Okay. Yeah, cool. I think we, we hit that pretty well um, Another question that somebody asked this is more of a functional or applicable question what is an appropriate way to determine one rep max? Um, so the yeah, so the one RM um, usually the way people work, the, the way you can do it is um, you usually start. So if you you know say for example you're doing a bench press right and you're um, trying to get to 300 pounds um, or you're, you think you're you you estimate that you're gonna um, probably be maxing out around 300 pounds. Um, so typically people start out usually doing their warm sets with five um so five reps you know hitting the bar five reps if, if you feel like doing 10 reps um and then slowly working about 10 percent of the time so moving you know each set get 10 percent heavier um and with that in mind so when you start getting close to 50 60 percent of your one hour one rep max um you're going to start bringing those reps down to one right and then you're going to start doing true one rep attempts uh, until you reach that one rep max um, because there's there's a kind of a, a line that that you need to draw uh, when doing this um, between like how much um, stimulus you need to like to actually practice the lift before you get uh, to your one RM, but not doing too much that you become fatigued, so it's no longer a true one RM. Right. Okay. So after you do your one rep max, do you typically jump into your workout for that exercise at a particular percentage, or do you just wait till the next training session to uh, start your training to build that one rep max further? Um, usually, it's 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 done at that point. It it depends on the on the nature. So if, if my like you know if I'm going in and, I'm, and it's a testing day, yeah. right, and I'm going in and I'm going to be doing, um, uh, say I'm going to just kind of mimic a, a meet and do. Um, squat, bench, and deadlift. Um, that's all I'll do. I'll, I'll, I'll do, you know, get that stuff done and, and leave for the day. Um, big reason being, at least for, from my end, um, is it takes. I mean, it it wears on you like psychologically, mentally, to do a one RM. Yeah. Um, so then to follow that up with like another, like a you know, with a full workout. Um, people do it, but you just have to keep in mind that you're you're not going to be at your best, and you potentially are more prone to like injury at that point because you just hyped yourself up and you've gotten to this um, this like a, this point of emotional excitability, yeah. um, and then you have to kind of come back down if you want to do regular workout. So usually I separate the two if I'm going to do that. 
And if somebody is not competing, would you recommend that they do their squat, dead, and bench on the same day in terms of their one rep max attempts, or should they break it up day by day if they're not competing? I mean, it all depends on them if they feel like they can handle it. Um, but I, I, if if I wasn't competing, I'd probably split them up. So if I was going to do it, um, you know, do squat and bench on one day. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then delts on another. So try to get the lower bodies away from each other. Okay. Um, it can be done, um, but again, you just have to kind of consider yourself, and you know, it, and also consider the context too. So if you're, um, you know, so if you're trying to um, use this one R ramp to be used in training, right? You probably in training are only going to do bench, and you're only going to do squat and mm -hmm. delts in a session. Um, so you want your testing to mimic that, um, so that. You know, so if so, if you did your bench squat and deadlift in, in, in one day, and you did your one hour run rep max, there could be some accumulating fatigue you got from doing squats and then going over to bench press, right? So there's a chance you're not mimicking the training session nearly as um, as much if you were to do it that way. Right. But it all depends. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question: What makes a muscle stronger? This uh, this is more of a physiological question. So if you so, had to describe it. Yeah, so there's there's a lot. The, the actual muscle itself is going to become stronger based on, um, from, a, from a structural perspective, just based on increase in, in its cross-sectional area, right? Okay. So you take a bicep, you cut it down the center, um, the width and, like, the circumference that exists in that, in, in that muscle belly, uh -huh. if you make it bigger, right, um, you know, and, and by making it bigger, you're increasing all the different contractile components within it, Um then your force potential is a lot greater because you can increase the amount of proteins that are responsible for producing the force. Therefore, you should be able to produce more force. Um, that's more from a structural component. Um, but there's a lot of other things that play into the muscle that have an effect on strength as well. Um, neural input being the biggest one. Right. So there's a reason being there's a reason behind the fact that um, if you look at some like power lifters and Olympic lifters, um, the amount of weight they're lifting is much, much more than your typical bodybuilder. Even though the bodybuilder is bigger and has a greater cross-sectional area, the power lifters and, 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 and um, Olympic lifters can lift more. Um, and part of that is because of the neural input they have. So they've, you know, they've trained themselves so that um, for any given attempt, they're able to recruit more muscle fibers for that attempt, right? So they're able to use a greater percentage of the total muscle fibers that they have to um, contribute to that lift. Um, another thing is, so our muscles um, have kind of like kind of like a chip in a car, right? So the chip in a car prevents it from going to a certain speed. Yeah. Our muscle has that as well, um, called Golgi tendon organs. And if we're able to, with training, start inhibiting those or, or knocking that feedback down, um, that otherwise would come back and inhibit the muscle from contracting. Right then you're able to produce more force. Um, so a lot, yeah, so there's different, different neurological aspects that play into it in addition to structural aspects, um, both of which obviously can work together to allow the muscle to produce more force. So if you're getting a, an increase in cross-sectional area, are you only getting an increase in the, uh, let's say, like the myosin and actin filaments, like the actual contractile components, or are you getting increases in essentially the entire muscle cell, the other compartments of the muscle cell? Um, yes, and, and I guess then that all depends on the lifting as well or what type of exercise you're doing. Mm -hmm. So obviously if you're, if you're really into resistance training, then that's going to be um, predominantly what's contributing to that in addition to the, the sarcoplasm and the cytoplasm that makes up that muscle. Um, because you're going to start, you know, the supercompensation of glycogen, you have more glycogen, the more water that's going to come into the muscle, um, and increase like the fluid volume in the, in the muscle cell itself as well. Um, but yes, the, um, the amount of the myosin actin is going to obviously increase with, with resistance training in addition to the SR. So your sarcoplasmic reticulum that would actually stores the calcium, that density will increase as well with resistance training. Okay, cool. Uh, if you, uh, when you talk about like a motor unit, which is the, the neuron and the actual muscle fiber, uh, do you see 
changes in that actual motor unit. So not just the muscle fiber, but the connections between the, I guess what the motor end plate, the actual muscle uh, cell end plate and the axon terminal. So do you see differences? I've, I've seen stuff where, um, I mean, the, the, sensitivity so the acetylcholine receptor sensitivity becomes higher you may start producing more so i guess it's back up acetylcholine is the necessary neurotransmitter you need to uh for an alpha motor neuron to stimulate a muscle fiber to contract um so therefore your ability to um respond your muscles ability to respond to that is going to increase potentially um so there are different types of remodeling that can happen that allow the muscle to respond better to the acetylcholine release okay um i'm not as familiar with that aspect but um i do know there is some stuff on that for on, on that component yes. okay and if we were to let's say so far we've been looking at it as from a lens of let's say multiple muscle fibers or even within a single muscle cell muscle fiber muscle cell same difference um, mm -hmm. and the motor unit but if we were to extend that view outwards and look at a muscle belly so you know if you look at your bicep for example that's always the classic example mm -hmm. i use the actual composition of that muscle does that make a difference in terms of the type 1 fibers and type 2 fibers and things of that nature when it comes to strength specifically of course yes um so there are and, and that kind of and, and we'll talk about that i guess in, in a second but that kind of ties into the genetic component of responders versus non-responders and and what you can do and which um in, you know what you can attain with lifting um but yes that definitely plays a role so um individuals with a higher percentage of type 2a or type 2x or your, your um, predominantly fast muscles um the the fibers themselves aren't necessarily if you look at them individually aren't necessarily um bigger or stronger um but from a power perspective they can produce more force um so they're and the other thing to consider as well is that if you have a higher percentage of um type 2 muscle fibers um then most of the time the motor units that tie into them so, so there's going to be more muscle fibers that can be recruited at any given time. Okay. So for example, so type two muscle fibers or type two motor units um, have are able to connect to a lot more muscle fibers um, than that of a type one. So if you have more type two motor units that exist, then you're able to recruit at any given time more muscle fibers, um, which so if we, if we think about it at a, at a moment in time, then you're able to accumulate more force than someone who has predominantly type 1 motor units. Okay. So the, the actual difference of the muscle cell itself isn't all that different then between type 1? Say that one more time. The actual difference within, like, if you were to take, take away the neural component of it and just look at the difference between, let's say, a type 1 muscle fiber and a type 2 muscle fiber so type 2 being fast twitch type 1 being slow twitch classically yeah. speaking do you do you see any differences between those two types of muscles uh, so you do you do see differences in in total and absolute force production they are around the same and again size is very similar uh -huh. but power is going to be a lot different so the rate at which they can produce their force is going to be much higher in the type twos um, compared to the type ones and the energy system requirements that they have is going to be a lot different so your fast fibers are going to rely on more of the faster energy systems so more your glycolytic ATP PCR things that can turn over ATP much faster. Um, and then the other thing to consider as well is that the, uh, I mentioned this previously, but the sarcoplasm reticulum, okay. the, uh, the calcium store component in type two is going to be much higher, meaning that they can release calcium at a much higher rate, contributing to that, um, increase in, um, in the rate of force production. Okay. And does the, uh, this is the one last question on that specific point, the SR, does the reuptake of calcium, does that play a factor? Uh, that does play a factor. So the um, so when you look at your ability to relax the muscle, um, it the the fast twitch muscle fibers have a much higher so the circuit pumps are much faster. Um, they can cycle through ATP a lot quicker. So your your uptake rates are faster, meaning that the muscle can relax faster and get ready for the next um, attempt or whatever you're doing following that. Um, 
So yes, so yes that th those are different as well. Um, the next question. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about, now we've talked about, you know, what makes a muscle stronger. The next question is completely out of left field. I didn't even send this to you. What is your favorite color? <laughs> What is, what is my favorite color? color? <laughs> oh, man. Um, depends, depends on the day, I think, honestly. Depends on the day, so, okay. Yeah, it depends on the day. If it's, you know, um, so throw one out. If it's a good, yeah, if it's a good day in the lab, then blue. I'm going blue. Um, <laughs> it's kind of counter. If it's a really good day, it's like, I, like I'm typically a navy blue type of guy. I like, I na like navy blue. I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. I like navy blue. Uh, yes. um, but... Shame. Um, and if it's, if it's a spectacular day, it's going to be baby blue, like the sky, like the Carolina blues. Um, if it's a bad day, it's probably, I'm, I'm going to stick with like, um, the color of my soul at that point, which is black. <laughs> okay, great. All right. So let's, let's move on to some practical guidelines. So for beginners, uh, what are some guidelines, just general guidelines that you would give somebody who is just first starting out in the gym, maybe hasn't lifted at all to, to the point where they've lifted for, let's say, like three months, something like that? What are some things that they should look out for? What are some things that you think are uh, important for complete beginners? Um, complete beginners, the best thing to do, learn how to do the lifts. Right. Don't focus on trying to get PRs at that moment in time. Um, focus on being able to do the lifts properly. Um, so focus on low loads and probably not go too crazy with the volume either, uh, to which you're fatiguing yourself and potentially developing some um, pretty poor mechanics. Um, so, you know, a lot of the times this word is kind of thrown out, and I think it's very important, is general physical preparedness. Um, so it's essentially getting in better shape. Um, so you need to be able to point in which you are uh, in good enough shape, whether that's um, you're doing that through um, kind of like cardio or whatever it may be, so that you, when you go into the weight room, you're going to be able um, to do five or six exercises and not feel like you're going to die, right? right? Because, because otherwise, you, you, you know, you're not going to get much out of it. So you need to develop, um, you need to get in better shape first um, before you can actually go and, and, and try to recover from, you know, 85% loads. So I think that those are the two big things is trying to get in better shape first. Um, so focusing on low volume, um, or sorry, um, low weight, higher volume, and focusing on the technicality of lifts and really appreciating um, the intricacies of each of the lift and trying to figure out what works for you um, in terms of, you know, getting through those lifts. So, for example, if you're trying to deadlift, are you going to be a sumo, conventional? A lot of that stuff in my mind doesn't matter for beginners, um, but things that you need to figure out about your own body um, before really moving forward with a, um, a high intense strength program. Okay about for example exercise selection which you mentioned that uh briefly do you think that it's important for everybody to squat and for everybody to deadlift do they have to do that to, to become a stronger version of themselves no no not to become a stronger version of themselves i mean i personally think the squat bench the deadlift are like the three lifts that, that have and will ever exist uh, but if if that's not your goal then you know don't worry about it i think um what those lifts bring to the table um, in terms of uh, improving whole body strength um, and, you know, adaptations for pretty much w w whatever your goal is, is going to be, is, is good. Um, but if, if that's not something you want to do, if that's not something you enjoy, then don't do it. You know, it's, it's not worth it to, um, if you don't, if you had, if you're going into the gym and you have no aspirations to be a power lifter, um, or an Olympic lifter or anything like that, and you hate doing squats, and don't do squats. Right. Um, I highly recommend them, and I, I think they are a great exercise. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, from every perspective, biomechanical, metabolic, and psychological. Yeah. Um, but if it's not something you enjoy, and it's not something you need, then don't do it. All right, you heard it here first, folks. Skip leg day. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, definitely don't skip leg day. No. <laughs> Okay, so you talked about two really important things for beginners. What are, and this is what most people are usually really concerned about, is once you become more of an advanced athlete or trainee, let's say you get up to, I mean, 
there are plenty of people that can do a 315 bench, but let's just say 315 bench. You know, obviously mm -hmm. things start to plateau, things start to slow down, or they hit, you know, a 315 squat or 405 squat or something along those lines. Uh, you know, things start to slow down. You just get to that threshold, you get to that plateau, and you've talked about this already. But what are some things that you implemented, for example, that would probably be a really good base that some techniques, some tips, tricks, I mean, whatever it is, if that's programming, if that's nutrition, if that's uh, certain like equipment that you use that helped you kind of eke out those next, you know, the next 10 pounds, 20 pounds, things like that. Well, the first thing is identifying the problem. Um, so figuring out where, again, your problem lies. So usually it's because I'm not being truthful with myself and I'm not doing that 99% that I talked about previously. Um, but if not, then I also have to consider where I'm failing. So if I'm getting, you know, if I'm, if I'm squatting, for example, um, and I realize that I start like losing tension when I hit the bottom of the, of the position right? and, I, and I hit the hole, um, then I need to realize, oh, hey, um, I need to start doing a lot more hip work. I need to start doing a lot more hip extension work, um, good mornings, hip thrust, um, so I can improve my strength out of the hole. So you have to um, kind of determine where your weak points are that's keeping the rest of your lift behind. Um, and that'll help. So like, you know, so, so for um, bench press, for example, a lot of the times, again, people get stuck in the hole. If that's your problem, then you need to start incorporating a lot more um, like you know, chest and front delt work to get you out of that position, right? So you need to um, uh, kind of overload that part um, because clearly that is your weak point. Or some people even at the top, if they're failing at the top, then your triceps are your problem, uh -huh. right? Um, so you need to start incorporating more overloading movements and, and incorporate bands and chains, things that um, challenge you at the top to teach you to move past that, that range of motion. Okay. That, that, to, or, that teach you to move through that area of motion, that range of motion. Okay. And once you get to those plateau phases, what do you think is a feasible amount of weight to throw on to or to get onto your squat, for example, uh, after X amount of time? Like you, when you think of a beginner, it's essentially every week they go into the gym mm -hmm. and they stack on at least another five pounds and they're, you know, they're feeling like gods you know, the entire way for the, you know, the next three to six months. And then suddenly things start to slow down, but you still get some progressive overload and they maybe add five pounds every two weeks or whatever. But you eventually get to a point where you are just stuck, like you're just not going anywhere. So what do you think, let's say over, what's, what's a good timetable first off and how much weight can you roughly put onto particular lifts like a squat or a deadlift or a bench in that particular time frame. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to that one, man. It, it's, um, you know, there, there's certain people that just once they hit a, a, a certain plateau, they don't, they can't get out of it for months or even years. Yeah. Um, some that can figure it out within the weeks. I guess it's all dependent on the nature of the problem. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that kind of goes along with it. I mean, there's, there's certainly a reason why not all of us are lifting 500 pounds. You know, there's, if it was, if it was easy like that, then everybody would do it. Um, so, you know, and there's, there's a lot of things to consider, but, um, typically, I guess for me, at least if I am, if I'm not making progress or there's, there's not a reason for why I'm not making progress, whether it's injury or whatever the case, um, then I probably give myself three to four weeks, you know, if, if there's no, like nothing's happening, yeah. you know, um, then three to four weeks I need to figure out what's going wrong. I need to make a change. Um, and again, the nature of the change depends on what's going wrong. Okay. So that it depends on when I am. Within those three to four weeks, how many attempts do you give to try and improve? Is that just three or four times or is that eight times or... How many times per week, let's say, do you do you actually try and push past that plateau? It depends on the where I am, where I am in my training. You know, I'm not going to be maxing out every week. I, it, depending on the program I'm doing, I've done the conjugate system where you can uh, where you're maxing out every week on different lifts. Uh -huh. um, you know, and and the goal being is that you're going to try to attempt a new um, a new uh, one RM on that given lift anytime you go to try it again. Right. Um, you know, it all depends, but if, if I'm in a period of time where I'm just kind of accumulating volume, then I'm not, 
you know, I, I, I won't, I won't know um, until a few months after that, if 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 it actually worked. So there's, like I said, it all depends. It all depends on where I am um, to be able to truly understand um, where my strength lies. Right. Okay, so you just mentioned accumulating volume. Why would somebody want to do that over something like trying to max out every week? Well, because volume is a lot easier in the nervous system, number one. Um, so the CNS, you know, if you're, if you're doing volume, it's placing more of a, a structural demand in your body and not, not necessarily as much of a neuro, uh, neurological demand. Um, the uh, structural demand is a lot easier to recover from, in my mind. Um, so... Um, and the other thing too to keep in mind is that when you're training at like a you know a much higher volume, um, you are still getting the adaptations, not necessarily as much of the neurological adaptations, but you are still getting the physical adaptations, obviously with hypertrophy. Um, and the other thing to consider as well is, and a lot of programs incorporate this, um, is that when you're using a lower, like a higher volume, lower loads, your form is probably going to be a lot better. Right. So you know you you are um, you are still able to train. Um, so I guess that's 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 kind of the idea to consider. I think. Um, Louis Simmons brought this up, the, the founder of Westside Barbell, um, is that you need to uh, don't train maximally, train optimally. Um, so a lot of people get stuck with the fact that if they're strength training, they need to max out all the time. That's not necessarily the case. Um, you need to kind of mess around with that and figure out um, when is the proper time to peak, when's the proper time to max out, um, and when's the proper time to use volume as your means to get stronger Okay. or, or bigger and things like that. Yeah, um, okay. I, I, I kind of danced around that a lot, so I'm trying to no. figure it. Like I, so, so it, it, again, it, it all depends really on um, on where you are in your system to start evaluating these things. And do you think that it's possible to evaluate without a one rep max, or do you think that it's possible to uh, essentially continue to make progress without having these evaluations of your one rep max? Yes. Yes. So. so um, if you, you know, if you're following a period, if you're following a program, right, uh -huh. then you've already scheduled um, your, um, then you're, and if you're looking at it, you have uh, scheduled attempts. So you know that you're going to be doing, you know, say if your uh, max is four or four, your max is 500 pounds and you've scheduled one week to do um, four or five. Um, so about 80% of your one RM for sets of two, for five sets of two, for example. Um, and if you can't do that, or if, if, if following, we, you know, a few weeks that you continue to fail at that weight, then it's probably time to look, at, look back and be like, okay, um, clearly this isn't my one RM anymore right. or it hasn't been recently. Um, why is that? Because this is what I plan to do. So what's going on in my life or what's going on in my training that's not allowing me to hit these weights. Right. right? And, you need, and you need to kind of look back at that. Um, so. And a, and a lot of the times, the way people account for it is they use what's known as a training max. Um, so they don't. So whatever their one RM is, um, you know, say they they came in, they were well rested, they they ate awesome that day, uh, they were all pumped up to go, and they did their one R, one rep max, and that's what we're going to be using for the whole training cycle to base their percentages off of. Um, there's a good chance that on any given one of those days, they couldn't do that one rep max again, right? So the one rep max isn't true for every single day. So therefore, their percentages that they're using are kind of a lie, it's a misrepresentation. So what people do is they actually use their, their training max, so they'll take the one RM that they, that they, that they um, achieved and they'll use 90% of that, and they'll call that their training max. So that way, it gives them kind of a buffer. Yeah, right. So if they didn't sleep well that day, right, or they didn't eat well that day, or something, happen something is happening at work, um, that's kind of taken their mind in a different place, um, they, they'll still be able to hit that 90%, right? That 90% of their 1RM. They won't be able to hit their true 1RM, right. but they'll be able to hit about 90% of that, uh, meaning that they'll, they'll be able to hit all of the weight percentages that come off of it. 
And you think that can be as effective as using your true one rep max? I mean, obviously, I think it's. I honestly think it's more effective. More. Effective. I think it's much more effective. Okay. Yes. Um, and mainly because the the, uh, the prevalence of failure is not going to be as high okay. if you use that component. So yeah, using heavier weights is going to obviously elicit more adaptation. But if you're failing at those heavier weights, um, then you are going to be screwed. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, sweet. So actually on that topic, uh, talking about training and all these different different adaptations, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about undulating periodization? So you've mentioned periodization. You've talked about linear periodization a little bit in passing. Can you talk about what undulating periodization is and linear periodization? I mean, whatever pops in your head, but I'd, I think a lot of people would be really interested in learning what undulating is. Yeah, so undulating is the it's more commonly known as like or the um, the more popular is the daily undulating. Uh -huh. um, so what that really means is you're, is the is you're kind of playing around um, with intensity and volume. So you're constantly from a, a week to week or day to day basis, you are changing the volume and intensity that you're using for a specific lift. Um, drastically, so not like very small percentage change, but pretty drastic changes. So, um, so for example, bench press, you'll be going eight sets of two one day, two sets of eight on a different day. Okay. Right. So you're essentially doing the inverse yeah. um, from day to day. Um, and what that allows you to do is, and, and there's a lot of science that actually backs this up as, as it being uh, very efficacious in strength training, is it allows you to uh, focus on different components of your physiology at one time. Um, so it allows you to work on strength, it allows you to work on power, it allows you to work on hypertrophy. Okay. Because um, I think the concept for a while was that a lot of those things can actually fight against each other. Uh -huh. So if you try to focus on all those things at any given one time, they're going to fight because your body won't be able to adapt to all three at the same time. And that's not true. Those things actually synergize with each other. Um, so undulating periodization takes advantage of that concept and incorporates all of those different um, intensity zones um, in a given training cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so yeah. So it's it's and again, I think that's part of the reason why it's it's been so efficacious. Um, and it kind of ties in a little bit. So there's the there's the conjugate system that a lot of people use. Um, that incorporates uh, like max effort days. So using um, you know super high loads at low speeds, and then dynamic effort days, which is um, lighter loads. So um, you know closer to that, like. 40, 60, 50, 70 percent range um, and using um, and you know, accommodating that with bands and chains and moving it super quickly or very quickly. Um, you know, because again, if you can um, focus on speed and power or, or strength and power at the same time, those two things are going to synergize with each other. Okay. So is there, do you think that somebody should focus on undulating periodization after X amount of training time as, as in their experience? Or can a person just start right from the get go and start using that kind of system? I, I, I think you could at any point use that system. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd be hesitant as, okay. So as long as you have, um, the ability to perform the lifts through a range of intensities correctly, then yes, I think that is uh, suitable for that. Okay. Um, but not a, not until that happens can you actually can you actually participate in an undulating periodization program? Okay. So in my mind. So would you can you talk a little bit about what linear periodization is? Yeah, so linear periodization is a, is the is kind of that concept, but spread out across um, an entire like you know macro cycle. So in a, so um, going from off season to in season to, tra to like competition. And what what is a macro cycle? Uh, so a macro cycle is uh, like a long term plan. Okay. So long term, usually like a year. Okay. Um, so it's a combination of all like the. Um, the week, the weeks or months long mesocycles that add up into a, into a macro cycle. Um, so with linear periodization, the way it works is it again, incorporates the, the, the two, um, two components. So intensity and volume, 
Um, but at, so when you're closer to the off season, uh, you're going to be focusing and spending a lot of more of your time focusing on volume. So higher volume, lower intensity. But then as you get closer to competition time, you're going to start cutting out that volume and incorporating a lot more intensity. Okay. Um, so working more at the at the end, more on strength and power. Um, so the the idea is um, is at the beginning you start improving so you increase your hypertrophy you increase your muscle size with a lot of the volume um, so that the, the increase in muscle size you saw during that period will be able to carry over or your potential to produce force will carry over into the strength and power phases okay so you're essentially taking that same principle you're talking about earlier with an increase in cross-sectional area with muscle strength the actual muscle mm-hmm. itself getting stronger from an increase in cross-sectional area. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to be yep. training yep. your neural system to start implementing that most efficiently. That's that's yes. pretty interesting. Yes. Yep. Okay. What do you feel are some of the biggest mistakes that people make in the gym? We'll see people and myself make yeah. um, <laughs> potentially over and over again, <laughs> the definition of insanity. Uh, um, so one of the big things um, is people – typically Typically will do will only do do the things they like or the things they're good at at. Uh, and that's one of the biggest ones that i see so um you know and and very rarely are those two things ever what you need to focus on to get better yeah right because if you're good at something you're going to always be good at that yeah right right so like that's not what's holding you back it's the things that you don't like and you're not good at that's holding you back and that's what you're not doing um so a great example um for me for example is i was on this like um i was on this box squat kick for a while i'm like oh box squats are it box squats are great um you know i could box squat more than i could free squat so i'm like i'm just gonna keep doing box squats and those are great And as I was doing that for months and months and months, and I went to go, um, you know, go back to free weight squats or just free squats, um, I sat down in the hole and I didn't get back up, Um, mainly because I was so reliant on the box. Like, that was what I trained for and that's what I was good at. Um, You know, so that was an example of me just failing. Like, I, you know, uh, because I focused on the wrong thing. Like, I didn't focus on what I needed to to make um, to make myself a stronger squatter. I focused on the things that need that I needed to make myself a stronger box squatter, yeah. which then who cares? Um, you know, and, and that, and I think that carries over to a lot of things. And, and the other thing is, you know, the idea of ego lifting. Um, so a lot of people see these, um, these very narrow um, range of motion exercises. So board presses, for example, floor press, um, things that kind of overload a, the, you know, the latter half of a yeah. movement. Um, and they're like, well, no, no, I'm doing this. I'm definitely getting stronger. Okay. Well, if you keep doing that over and over again and you keep neglecting the first half of the movement, that's going to be your weak point yeah. at that, you know, at, at some point. Um, just because you're lifting really heavy the last three quarters of a bench press doesn't mean you can use that weight for the whole range of motion of a bench press. Um, and people get caught in that trap an awful lot too because they realize how much they can do um, with these very like small range of motion exercises and they get caught in the eagle lift. Yeah, um, that makes sense. So that's another big one. Um, and it kind of ties in again with the weak points but not doing the... Um, so one trap that a lot of people get into is, is not taking um, the proper time to do their assistance exercises. I've gotten that trap more times than I like to even admit. Um, but there's so many times where people will just go into the gym if they're going, you know, if they're um, heavy resistance training or power lifts or anything like that, they'll get done with their squat sets and be like, I'm good, and then they'll leave. Um, and I've, I, I did that. I've done that with you. You've, you've been there to watch me just be like, yep, yeah, I'll see you later. Um, right. And the problem is, is like, because you, and you know, and, and, and part of the reason you do that is because at that time, you know, you're hitting your weights and you're doing really good, um, and you're crushing PRs and stuff like that. You're like, oh, this can go on forever. I don't need assistance. But what you're not noticing is that over the times, you're building up these muscle balances, you're building up weak points that you don't see, um, but will eventually come back to bite you in the ass. Right. And then when you stop, when you stop hitting PRs, and you're like, oh, what happened? No, it's because you you, you weren't paying attention to the assistance level. 
us that we're going to help you continue to, to, to move past these PRs and these, um, or move it, you know, into new right. PRs. Yeah. So that, that's, and that's another big trap that a lot of, um, power lifters, specifically fat ones like me run into, um, is they just, they fail to, or they, they get lazy and they stop doing the assistance movements. Um, you know, and things that are actually going to build up their main lifts. Yeah, those are good ones so, for sure. Those are ones that most people don't really talk about all that much, but that's definitely yeah. true. Another one, and this is, um, I think, a little less. I've never done this. I know you've never done this, but don't ever crawl in the squat rack. <laughs> never curl in the squat rack. If you curl in the squat rack, there's another layer of health for you that you can find on your way there. <laughs> I will admit I have a picture of me curling in the squat rack at, <laughs> in, although it's in my own squat rack in the one that I bought. So, well, I, that's, that's, well, that's that's. I mean, that's still a sin, but at least a little bit. A you're not sin. wasting anybody else's time. Uh, hey everyone! So as you can see, the podcast suddenly cut off right at the end. Uh, honestly, I had a bunch of technical difficulties for about 45 minutes before the podcast, and then I had technical difficulties during the podcast. And as you can see, I had technical difficulties at the end of the podcast. But hopefully the information got across. Hopefully it was informative for you. And I really hope that you gain something from it. Uh, Alec and I were talking about doing further episodes where we dissect papers, things of that nature. So if you're interested in something like that, then let me know. Uh, let me know if you have any other added questions, kind of follow-up questions that you'd like me to ask him. And with that said, I certainly appreciate you stopping by and checking out uh, what Alec had to say, what we had to say. And I genuinely hope that I have the pleasure of speaking with you in the next one. Have a good one, guys. Bye.